everybody. Welcome to HackerCast. It is our first HackerCast of the year. Welcome to 2015, where we get to talk about all the cool web security stuff going on in the world. I'm here, as always, uh, founder and CEO, Jeremiah Grossman. I'm here with Robert and Robert Hansen, sorry, our snake, as actually known. I'm glad and, you uh, were finally on a first name basis here, Jared. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there we got Matt Johansson, manager TRC Houston. Hello, hello. All right, so uh, let's get to it, guys. Let's talk about all the cool web security stuff that happened over the last week. And there's always a lot of it, so break it down and make it easy to understand, even for us, is a little bit challenging. But there was a, an interesting thing that happened with, uh, with GitHub last week, being blocked by India. Uh, who's got that one? That would be me. <clears throat> so I, I actually thought this was probably one of the more interesting stories I've heard. So first of all, we all know India has a ton of developers, like a good chunk of the world's developers live in India. And a good chunk of the code on the internet lives on GitHub. <laughs> so <clears throat> the... Um, the Indian government said, citing terrorism as a source uh, for why they're blocking a bunch of different sites, uh, decided that GitHub needed to go away from their country. Uh, so all of a sudden, every single Indian developer on Earth uh, <laughs> who, uh, who needed to get to GitHub through India was not able to do so. So I think the market for VPNs skyrocketed in one day. <laughs> but, but, but here's the best part about this. So they didn't just block uh, GitHub. They blocked a whole bunch of other things. Uh, they blocked things like um, the Internet Archive, Weebly, a bunch of other sites, cop a bunch of copy-paste type sites, uh, like Pastebin, you know, uh, where you can paste results into something and somebody can get it later. Um, which I think the reason is, I think the rationale is... Um, terrorists are pl placing stuff on a uh, place where you can paste uh, objects or paste messages and then can be read later by other people. So um, one of the places they blocked wasn't a, a domain, it was actually a URL, which is even weirder, uh, sourceforge.net slash project slash forky, P-H-O-R-K-I-E, which is uh, very similar to GitHub except it's a project. So they're pr trying to block anyone from using that project anywhere else, even though it's often designed to be used inside of companies, not like publicly accessible. So way overreaction, obviously. But <laughs> so I guess one is who's minding the shop over there on the the Great Firewall of India, but also that I mean, just so business disruption doesn't happen, it looks like everybody's gonna have to move to VPN. I mean, this relates to the the next story here, the GoGo -Go in flight stuff, but like. Basically, it's going to have, you know, if you're dealing with an SSL environment, you know, VPN, that gets around the sensors easy enough, but that's, you're going to have to do it. If they're going to block websites, they're going to have to use SSL VPN. Oh, I totally agree. Um, and, I mean, and this has basically forced the adversaries to use things like Tor and all this other stuff, and that just makes their lives harder, you know. I mean, uh, makes, I mean the Indian government's life harder. It doesn't make the terrorist job any harder. <laughs> it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing, though. Like, no matter how much we learn, how much we see how this blocking of sites doesn't work, I mean, the Internet is designed to route around damage. I mean, that's what the entire intent is. But for whatever reason, that concept doesn't stick. There's still website blacklists out there as if those are going to work. So I don't know if we'll ever get over it. Maybe if people suffer enough disruption in business or their daily lives, that SSL VPN would be the way to go, and that'll be about it. So let, let's talk. Let's let's relate it back to this GoGo in-flight thing that uh, one of the Google engineers found. Or ironically, it was a Google engineer in-flight that they found this one. I, who who is covering this one? Uh, I got this one. I think you know all of us have probably you know. We're all frequent flyers, and we all are forced to sometimes use this incredibly slow internet service. But uh, in, in, in spite of being incredibly slow, they also seem to be issuing fake SSL certificates. I, I think what the GoGo CTO said was something like, uh, streaming is not allowed, so they're blocking like YouTube and things like that, you know, to help save the bandwidth. Because you know, imagine we we. It's funny how spoiled we are. You know, there's a plane traveling at like 600 miles an hour, you know, at 30,000 feet, and we're complaining about slow internet access. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a Louis C.K. joke about this. It's like, oh, this is the newest technology I can think of, and all of a sudden it's owed to me to be perfect and working every day. <laughs> but. Uh, so I guess they are man in the middle in it for some reason to block the sites or to downgrade the quality or something like that. Um, but, yeah, they're uh, trying, that's their response, right, is that they're trying to uh, 
kind of cap streaming video services, but at the same time, they're completely, you know, decrypting and, and re you know, re-quote-unquote encrypting with a fake GoGo signed SSL cert some potentially sensitive traffic that does include your Google session cookie. Um, yeah. Not not a good not a good idea, but I get you guess you know if a Google engineer found it, that means everybody else is just clicking through. Oh, I, I think th this actually points to another problem that really no one ever addresses when we're talking about computer security. SSL and TLS do not work for the average consumer, period. I mean just don't. They don't work at all because people do click through those things all the time. So you don't need a poodle, you don't need some crazy downgrade or whatever. You just need to put up a fake certificate and people will click through anyway and you'll get exactly what you want. You don't need to do any crazy tricks. It's just not, you don't need it, you know? Maybe with a determined, or a really like tech savvy adversary that would be helpful, but even then I bet most would just go, oh, whatever, click, click, click. It, it seems like, so we have this large online push these days to make everything SSL or everything encrypted. But at the same time, that's actually going to force those like GoGo or Salt, those with similar interests to man in the middle more stuff. So as we get more SSL, we get more man in the middle. That'll be an interesting one to see play out. Yeah. And the other thing is that the, a lot of times those really terrible like SSL certificate uh, man in the middle techniques are just typing GoGo in flat wireless or hacked certificate or something. But you could put YouTube in there. You could say it's YouTube. I mean, it doesn't doesn't authenticate to any CAs that you have in your browser, but, I mean, if someone clicked on it, they go, oh, this is YouTube, Some, I don't know, something must be broken, whatever, click, click, click. Let's go through it. Right right. Yeah. All right, let's move on from the SSL nonsense and things like that, and let's talk about browsers. Something about a North Korean browser is on the list. Um, yes. yes. So this is Nanera, <clears throat> which you're looking at here, <clears throat> and Nanera is the uh, North Korean browser uh, the, they have their own special operating system that's designed to look a lot like a Mac. Um, I, I'm not sure what it's based on, either Linux or FreeBSD or something. But one thing you'll notice right away is in that URL bar, it says HTTP colon slash slash 10 dot whatever. Uh, that means that um, every single user who starts their browser in North Korea suddenly has to go to this particular URL, which is only accessible if you're uh, behind a firewall. You know, it's a non-routable IP space. Uh, 10 dot is RFC nineteen eighteen, and it's over HTTP. So, <laughs> uh, what this effectively means is that all of North Korea. I mean, we, I think we kind of already knew that they were all on one gigantic network together. But I always assumed, personally, and you know, assumptions are not a great one, I guess. But I always assumed that everybody was using um, uh, access control lists and you know some redirect rules or whatever to 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 make that internal network. But apparently, I think everybody is just on one gigantic RFC 1918 um, um, uh, class A uh, 10 dot network. Pretty pretty funky. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know why. I, I kind of want to use that browser for some reason. Can, where do we can we get that software? <laughs> uh, well, you, like somebody actually bought it. So yeah, maybe you can you know get a copy from him or something. A pirate a copy. I'm not sure, but. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be kind of curious to see it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, this is just this is just insane. I think I, I mean I wish we had a screenshot of the, my face when Robert first pulled this up and showed me this thing. When you install the browser, it makes a request to ten dot something. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and like download something. Like, what the heck? <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about uh. Actually, let's see on the on the browser thing for a second. Um, there was a we we mocked uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, you know, Google's former CEO, and I think he's still chairman over there. He made some statements a while back. You guys remember this? Uh, said somebody asked him a question in an audience that said, uh, "So if you want to stay out of uh, NSA surveillance on the web, what do you do?" And he says, "Run incognito on Chrome," and you know, we all face palmed, including the Google engineers. And so to add insult to injury here, there was some research done by a Brit, the article said in Forbes, that said Eric Schmidt was totally wrong, incognito doesn't work. But Robert might have some interesting background here on this one, uh, this, yeah. how, how the hack works and when the hack was actually found. Yeah, so, so the article is written by Sam Greenhay. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, and basically the attack works like this. So a, a user goes to a particular website and it's got a parody bit. That parody bit says, have you ever been here before? If you have been here before, you'll go to HTTPS. If you haven't been there, you'll go to HTTP. 
because S uh, STS, Trip Transport Security, forces your browser to always go back to HTTPS. So that's how you know if they've been there or not before. If they haven't been there before, you, you set a various, you basically create an iframe with a bunch of sub iframes in there to a bunch of different subdomains. Each one of those subdomains will or won't set you to HTTPS. So count this as one, this is zero, this is one, this is one. So that'd be 11. Um, or 1011 in binary actually works out to being 11. So you, that's the 11th person who's ever visited there. When the subsequently, when they come back, instead of hitting this page, uh, the HTTPS parity bit, they hit the HTTP parity bit, they hit the HTTPS parity bit, which means they've been there before. So then you try to send them to all HTTPS. And the ones that redirect them back up to HTTPS instead of HTTP is the parity bit. That's the one that's, I'm mean, sorry, that works out to being the number, which is back to 11, so you can de-anonymize them. So uh, although Sam, you know, thought he came up with this, <laughs> this has actually been discussed quite a few times before. Um, I actually came up with this research uh, back in 2010, and there's actually some evidence that was even mentioned before that. Uh, so, th you know, that's one of the big perils of computer security is, you know, figuring out who's done what when and, you know, trying to trying to say you've done something is actually really tricky when we're all working on each other's work. So it's it's that's so this hack is kind of cool and also scary in a way because it's a well intentioned feature to try to get people to stick on you know SSL all the time and not be in the whole man in the middle scenario. And then a security feature makes you trackable. Mm -hmm. That kinda sucks. Well, you know, it's funny. I talked to the Google engineers about this. Um, actually, I, I, I truly believe that I came up with this exploit first. I just didn't talk about it. But whatever. Um, the, the major problem here is when I talked to the, the Google engineers and Firefox engineers about it, they said that, well, to get around that privacy issue, what we'll do is anytime you uh, clear your cookies and cache, uh, we will uh, also get rid of this thing. So people don't do that very often. But incognito mode is kind of designed to at least uh, pretend as if they've been cleared. So my understanding was that that was the intention, although I never actually tested it to make sure it worked that way, but my, my, my understanding was when you switch into incognito and back out, it was supposed to, between those two states, not keep that information cross, cross that boundary. But uh, maybe it doesn't work that way, but that sounds like it would be more of a bug and not so much a feature. So here's the one. So when we, we before we get on to the last story, let's uh, try to bring closure because it's a lot of SSL talk this week, a lot of browser security stuff. I mean, what advice do we give people these days? I think I know the answer to this one on the browser side, but what do we tell people? What do we tell our moms, dads, brothers, sisters who don't get to spend you know 40, 80 hours a week studying web security? How do they protect themselves online? What do we tell them? I always tell my mom she's already compromised. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. It, it, it's actually not in bad advice because if you look at the stats, uh, between 70 and 80 percent of uh, computers have, out, have malware on them already. So statistically speaking, she probably is already compromised. Um, and if you treat your browser as if it's already compromised, you're less likely to do bad things. Um, I have some, you know, as a web security expert, I have a whole bunch of crazy things I do on top of my browser that most people would never understand. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Aviator is what we tell people because they don't really have that option. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I think just mentally... But even, even, even Aviator's not going to deal with the SSL man-in-the-middle stuff. I mean, we're going to alert like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, the last mile of security is always the hard one, so I think a VPN is probably the right choice for the kind of above-average user. Uh, the average user is still not going to be able to understand what they're doing or know when they're in VPN or out of VPN, and it still doesn't help with the government. Um, government, the NSA just released some document basically claiming that they can hack... Or, Someone, I think WikiLeaks released it about the NSA saying they can hack VPN, SSL VPN connections. So uh, if you're worried about a true determined adversary, I don't think that's even going to help. Um, I think it works for the average bad guy, though. Hmm. Matt, any sage words? On it? What, you, Matt, what do you do differently in your browser? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Robert and I have a, a different view of, of browser world than a lot of people. <laughs> you know, a lot of uh, a lot of cross domain stuff just doesn't work. I turn all that off by default. I, you know, all plugins are off by default, which is really nice. I love that. I love seeing that little. Hey, no, Flash did not run. <laughs> corner and it shouldn't have run. And it's like, oh, yeah, why was that little Flash plug-in in the corner even there? I'm not doing anything. So, yeah, that kind of stuff. And then, 
you know, I always try, the, the thing, like, the one thing I try to tell, like, my family uh, about is, is password security. If you could, if you can kind of help yourself in any way to, like, get, keep yourself out of some low-hanging fruit, <clears throat> that certainly helps, right? Instead of just using one of the, you know, 100 most common passwords or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wouldn't be a, a web security, you know, it wouldn't be a hacker cast without talking about at least one hack. And uh, so, Matt, you're, we're looking at this thing called Moon, moon Pig Got Hacked. So first, what is Moon Pig? And well, then we'll talk about It's obviously a pig that you put on the moon, you know? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to look this up myself. This, I guess the reason we want to talk about this has nothing to do with what it, a moon pig is. Uh, <laughs> 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 but for sake of conversation, Moon Pig is some online, online mail order greeting card service. So really important sensitive data going on here <laughs> for the world of greeting cards, right? But uh, someone, uh, some researcher back in August of 2013 noticed a vulnerability with their API. Of course, this greeting card service has an API. <laughs> <laughs> I really like to automate my greeting cards. So uh, yeah, you notice this vulnerability where you could just kind of switch out a user ID and access other customers' information, and it's pretty pretty bad bug, uh, you know, for this service for what it is. So uh, they uh, this researcher let them know, you know, uh, responsible disclosure. Let them know. They said that they would quote unquote get right on it. Uh, and let's see, Engadget posted this uh, today, and so yesterday, nothing was fixed. That's when they wrote this article. They said, as of yesterday, nothing was fixed. So it's 17 months later, you know, all of their customers' data was exposed. Uh, this guy blogged about it, Engadget picked it up, and now the API is offline immediately. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> the reason we want to talk about this is apparently full disclosure still works. <laughs> so this goes this goes to something we've been saying a lot. It's not the everybody has vulnerabilities. I mean, statistically, we know this. When it comes down to it, though, it's the remediation rates and time to fixes matter. Yes, you can be vulnerable, but if you're fixing it within hours or days, you don't. You're, you're probably not going to get hacked. That's what it really comes down to. That's what separates the hacked from the not hacked is the time to fix and the remediation rates. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's web security this week. Well, last week, and uh, we'll see what uh, what's incoming this week, guys. Thanks, thank you, and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Rate, subscribe. Thanks. Take it easy.